All right, today we're going to look at the claims of uh, Father Peter Hears, his commentary against Catholicism, and we're going to look at, very briefly today, other comments he's made before. Now, in this very short little video here, uh, Father Peter Hears will go after uh, the filioque, but indeed we're going to talk about more than only the filioque. We're going to talk about the Immaculate Conception briefly, we're going to talk about the canon, and we're going to talk about purgatory. We'll cover various things because Father Peter Hears has talked about all of them before. And indeed, keep an eye out. We will be doing deeper, in-depth refutations of Father, Father Peter Hears on purgatory, on the Immaculate Conception. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be diving into even deeper shows in the future with um, rather than merely a refutation of just a few minutes, but uh, a few minutes of, of his content. But let, let's dive in right now to hear what Father Peter Hears has to say about Catholicism. I've narrowed the true Christian path to being either RC, I'm assuming Roman Catholic, or EO, I'm assuming Eastern Orthodox, and I pray to the Holy Spirit for guidance, but can't, I can't be certain which one it is. I know you will say EO, but I have to be sure. Okay, we'll keep praying then. God help you. What would you like to ask me about that? I can help you discern one of the things you can't discern. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know if you've done enough work because the chasm is pretty massive. Now, uh, Father Peter Hears will start off by being quite kind, and, and uh, you'll very, very clearly know start off by noting that he'll pray for the person and then right away we'll go off into noting that uh the person clearly hasn't read enough that there is a wide wide divide and you know even though i do believe there's a divide clearly uh, i think a large part of that divide has to do with online individuals rather than the on the ground scholarly world because I don't think that we should be separated when it comes to purgatory, the canon, immaculate conception, filioque. Very clearly, we have our differences when it comes to the papacy. But there's a problem there for our Eastern Orthodox friends in that when we were united, East and West, and ecumenical council after ecumenical council after ecumenical council, they agreed to the papal statements. They agreed with all of those flowery, incredible statements made of the papacy. They agreed. Now, today, trying to roll that back has not worked very well for them. And it hasn't worked very well because just look at how they're doing evangelizing. Now, I know people are going to say, well, look at the church of Pope Francis. Look at people leaving in droves to become Eastern Orthodox. That's fantasy land. Fantasy land. It is. The online toxic community doesn't transfer over to real people on the ground going to church. Fantasy land. So, but, you know, I don't think evangel evangelizing alone would prove which religion is the true one. I don't argue that by virtue of it being larger than orthodoxy, that that in and of itself, of itself proves that Catholicism is true. No, I think you can prove the Catholic faith is true, from the Bible and from the early fathers, very clearly, and early ecumenical councils as well. Like the fact that you would still think it's one or the other means that you're still in the paradigms and the presuppositions of the West, in my mind. Why? Why would that be? And when we look at the early fathers and topics that divide us, uh, clearly the Eastern fathers taught all of the papal prerogatives that Rome holds to today. They taught that in hell good. The Eastern Fathers clearly taught the Immaculate Conception, and your great Eastern saints taught it as well. They held the canon of Scripture that we hold to, not any of these other books that were never utilized in any council after council, local uh, as they may have been, but later, later as they became absorbed into ecumenical councils. And then purgatory. Very clearly the great Eastern saints held to as well. And even what Mark of Ephesus has to say about purgatory is very, very compatible with the Catholic view. Very compatible. Why is it 
that if a person is struggling or still discerning, why do you then assume that they're stuck in the Western mindset? I've heard it over and over. Oh, you know, you're stuck in the Western mindset. That's a really, really Latin way of thinking. And, and that really is, you know, that really is incorrect. You can find fathers, Latin fathers, Greek fathers, and Syriac fathers teaching these things that Catholics hold to today. Once you truly understand what orthodoxy is, and you understand the history and the theology and the spiritual life, it's not, you would not stand and say, mm, maybe I could be a Roman Catholic, maybe I could be Eastern Orthodox, which, by the way, we don't refer to in those terms. One, we would refer to as the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Yeah, right. Now, let me be very clear. Um, I, I'm going to agree in one point. When you do a deep dive into history, it becomes very apparent, but I want to be clear. A lot of my Catholic brothers and sisters don't know how to answer the Eastern Orthodox claims. They don't know how to. They don't know how to, which is why we have gone out of our way to write material and to debate against Eastern Orthodox. We've debated against their top scholars in the world. And I don't mean the toxic online community. I'm talking about real scholars that can read the languages, can read Greek, that do real translations. I'm not talking about any little kitty, kitty material. I'm not talking about guys that tell you, hey, read the fathers, and they point to the shaft outdated English collection because they can't read the languages. I'm talking about real, actual scholars of theirs. A lot of Catholics cannot answer the claims. Why? A lot of the times they don't know the arguments. They don't. They think that, we're, that we agree on virtually everything. Other than the papacy, and they think, well, maybe that is a, a language divide. No, that is a real divide. But you look at the early councils and the way that they spoke of the papacy, and the modern-day Eastern Orthodox are in trouble. They're in trouble. You look at purgatory and the way the Eastern Church held it from the beginning, the Eastern Fathers, even some utilizing the fiery language. By the way, the fiery language never became bound up with a dogma. But you have that in many Eastern fathers as well. So you look into the early church, and the early church was clearly Catholic. And this kind of divide that, well, that's a very Western way of thinking. It's fantasy land from Father Peter Hears. And Father Peter Hears is always welcomed on the show to debate. We know he won't come on to debate. We know that because when we invited him on to dialogue back when we were a part of Reason and Theology, when we invited him on to dialogue, he didn't want to have anything up, anything to do with it. Father Peter Hears will not allow anyone to challenge him, but we do challenge him to a debate. If you want to come on and debate or find a neutral platform, we are willing to debate you on any of the topics brought up today. We'll debate them. Orthodox Church. You can say Orthodox Catholic if you'd like. You can say Eastern Orthodox Catholic, but Eastern really is is more of a, it's not an essential at all uh, demarker. Uh, it's not what we use in the, in the symbol of faith. We talk about the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. That's the four marks of the one church that's been given to us by God. And that faith has been maintained. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Clearly been maintained which is why when you look at the early papal claims at the councils, very clearly today, the modern day Orthodox do not agree with them, do not agree with them. But we want to deal with, we're not dealing with the papacy today because he doesn't bring it up. We're going to deal with the claims that he does bring up in various, in various different parts of the video. And in a little clip that we caught wind of that it was actually, I never, I don't watch anything of Father Peter here as it was shared with me. Then I, I was shared a clip of the from the gospel truth, gospel truth, gospel simplicity with Austin, where he does talk about purgatory. We'll dive into that later. Remember, it's clearly not the case with Catholicism. And I really encourage you to watch our lessons, our 12, our 10 week lesson on ecclesiology, especially the, the lecture on the Ethical Council. I think it's lesson eight or maybe six, I can't remember, on St. Photios, the Great. What happened that led to the schism? essential to know and you will see i think you should see immediately that both historically theologically and spiritually the pope at the time and those who were influencing and running the show there mainly those from the north not the romans but the franks or the those uh <clears throat> heretical christians from the north who didn't accept the seventh ecumenical council and some of them were arians and all the rest they were now influencing heavily the papacy in the 11th century and they 
turned and walked away from the Eighth Ecumenical Council. They turned away from their own council that they had accepted, their own teachings that they had embraced. They turned away from them. And they decided to add the doctrine, the, the teaching, and the addition, which had been rejected by the Ecumenical Council under St. Photius in 879, the Eighth Ecumenical Council, which was accepted in Rome by the Romans from 879 beyond the schism. It wasn't until the end of the 11th century, to my knowledge, or even beyond, that they changed and rejected it and changed and said, no, 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 we don't recognize that anymore. That historical and theological spiritual reality there. In a moment, we're going to hear from Father Peter here as where, by the way, keep in mind the claim being laid down that Catholics turned away from the Eighth Ecumenical Council that they'd originally embraced. He's going to tell you right now that they decided to add the doctrine and the teaching which had which had been rejected. Now, he's going to claim that they added the fili that they originally rejected the filioque. Pay attention. There is so clearly pointing to the truth of orthodoxy. I don't know what else you need. They walked away from the faith, the council. They added the heretical phrase, which had been which had been rejected by the council. Some people say, "Well, the council didn't mention the filioque." It's obvious from all of the history and all of the comments and all of the minutes of the council that they're talking about the filioque. It's the one edition that had been brought to the Bulgarians and and the Orthodox were encountering in their part of the world, which they had rejected. It was it's, it's obvious. Every scholar knows that they're talking about the filioque. Well, that every scholar should be quoted. He's very clearly incorrect. And the interpretation of 879 by the papacy was never a condemnation of the filioque outside of the creed. Rome never condemned the filioque in 879. Scholarship does not support you, Father Peter Hears. You are incorrect. Rome had long held that the filioque was the fide. And I know you, you will bring up Leo III not being on board with the addition to the creed, but he personally held this teaching. He personally held to this teaching, and that cannot be denied. That cannot be denied. So we continue hearing these comments, and we must wonder, where were the scholars that you, you say, every scholar believes this, every scholar, where? Uh, the interpretation of 879 by the papacy was never a condemnation of the filioque outside of the creed. Rome never condemned the filioque in 879. Scholarship does not support you. I want to repeat it. It does not support you. And indeed, in the years that follow 879, Stephen V clearly affirmed that should Rome desire, Rome could add the filioque if she so desired. Now, what was, the, what was this based upon? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. We will get to that in a moment. But perhaps one thing that tends to get forgotten is that even more importantly, there is a Liber Diurnus. The Liber Diurnus is, is incredibly important. It is in one of the it is in one of the professions of faith that could be made by a Pope elect himself after his own ordination. And the filioque is found in all three extant codices. Now, we realize that most of the formula date between 600 to 800. And it's very important. We're going to look at the Libra Diurnus. Now, in all of them, the Pope-elect says, we believe in one God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the inseparable Trinity, namely the Father from whom are all things, the Son through whom are all things, and the Holy Spirit in whom are all things. Indeed, the Father unbegotten, but the Son alone begotten from the Father, but the Holy Spirit neither begotten nor unbegotten, but proceeding from the Father and the Son. Now, this is an important little factoid that we won't hear from Father Peter Hears. So we have to emphasize how massively important this is. It clearly shows us, it reveals to us what the Roman see believed at the time. Not this nonsense that Father Peter hears is spouting here. Now, I want to thank a mega scholar for helping me out here. 
I'll call him a mega unnamed scholar for the moment, but helping me translate multiple texts, providing brand new translations. By the way, he's one of the top uh, linguistic scholars. He's a, he's a master of the languages of Latin, of Greek. And I appreciate his help with his translation. Uh, and I'm just incredibly blown away because it shouldn't surprise anybody that the Liber fell out into disuse. When? By the time of the schism. So we see what Orthodox Rome believed. And we're being told over and over that, well, this was, uh, you know, this was clearly rejected at the time. You know, it's very clear that it was rejected. All, every scholar points to that. But unfortunately, history does, it's not on your side, Father. Father Peter, history is not on your side here. And we don't agree that you're, your cherry-picked scholarship supports you. Because we can quote scholars that don't support you. So the idea that all scholarship believes this is incorrect. Roman long held the filioque was, was the fide. And again, in the years following 879, Stephen V clearly affirmed that should Rome desire, Rome could add the filioque. Now, what was this based upon? By the basis of what could Rome add the filioque? we have the relevant section of Stephen V's commodatorium or instruction to his legates to the Slavs. The Holy Spirit is said neither to be unbegotten, lest there be two fathers, nor to be begotten, lest there be two sons, but is said to be proceeding from the Father and the Son. If they say it was forbidden by the Holy Fathers to add anything to him or subtract anything from the creed, say, the Holy Roman Church is the guardian and confirmer of the holy dogmas, because in the office of the vicar of the prince of the apostles, it wavers in nothing in the Catholic faith. The Lord himself saying, Simon, behold, Satan has desired you that he might sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may, might not fail. And when you are converted, confirm your brethren. This, the church, has led all the churches which erred the faith. And has strengthened those which waver, not by changing the holy dogmas, but by explaining them either to those which do not understand or to those which think wrongly. Now, this is very important. Very, very important. Why is it important? Now, if you've been paying attention, you realize very, very clearly what was quoted there. Now, read it again. Look at it again. What is being referred to there? Look at it. What was this based upon? Luke chapter 22. Just like we have pointed out many times before, just as Pope St. Agatha the Great and others before him invoked the clear biblical divine authority handed to St. Peter by Christ himself, so here we see the same thing being invoked. Look at that. Yet we're told that this was a novelty that originally 879 condemned the filioque. But history doesn't show that. The interpretation of 879, yet again, I'll repeat, by the papacy was never a condemnation of the filioque outside of the creed, ever, never. History is clearly not on your side here, Father Peter. Not on your side at all. Now, we think it very important to go over the letter here. Now, this will be a real joy for the audience. We're going to look at the beginning of the letter from Stephen V to Svatopluk, a ruler of the Slavs. Now, I hope that I didn't butcher the way to pronounce that. If I did, somebody that knows better down below, you can let me know. But let us dive in and read. We think this would be very edifying to the audience. Very, very edifying. Because you, with zeal for the faith, have devoted yourself with all devotion to the prince of the holy apostles, namely Peter, the key bearer of the heavenly kingdom, and have chosen his vicar as a principal patron before all the princes of this wave-tossed age, and have likewise committed yourself with your nobles and the rest of the people of the land to his guardianship. 
We with continuous prayers entreat God, the bestower of all good things, that you might be protected by the aid of him in whose hand are all the rights of kingdoms, in order that you, walled with the assistance and intercessions of Peter and Paul, the princes of the apostles, that you might be protected by the aid of him in whose hand are all the rights of the kingdom. We wanted to read that part again. In order that you walled with the assistance and intercessions of Peter and Paul, the princes of the apostles, might be both protected from the snares of the devil and gladdened with health of the body, so that you, safe in soul and body, from the eternal judge and adorned with good works, might be granted perpetual felicity. You will also find us who administer the office of his, Peter's, vicar, bearing due solicitude for you in any affair in which you will be in need of those things which pertain to your salvation, to be a protector by the, by the assistance of God in all things, you whom on account of the dignity of the faith, together with all your faithful, we, as of present, embrace with spiritual arms, as a spiritual son in love, no distance of the earth withstanding. Because therefore we have heard that you gasp eagerly for the Orthodox faith. We certainly also recognize from this sign that you wish to have recourse to your mother, namely the Holy Roman Church, which is the head of all the churches by a privilege conferred upon it and blessed Peter, the prince of the apostles, to whom the true shepherd committed his sheep. Look at this. To whom the true shepherd committed his sheep, saying, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Calling the mouths of those who blaspheme the orthodox faith, the gates of hell, which Roman church and the authority of Christ protected by the assistance of its creator, has destroyed all heresies and strengthened all who waver. The same Jesus Christ, our Lord, saying, Simon, behold, Satan has desired you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith might not fail. And when you are converted, confirm your brethren, who I ask, except the foolish man, should dare to be plunged into so great an abyss of blasphemy, that he might defame the faith of Peter. There follows a brief and insignificant portion of a sentence, which Lair notes to be unintelligible now. Now, this is a uh, layer noting that there is uh, a brief and insignificant portion. We continue, though. We embrace your devotion, which wishes to learn, that we might with meat praise extol your prudence, which strove not to wander elsewhere, but to consult that which is the head, from which all the churches also receive their beginning. However, the foundation of the faith upon which Christ established his church is this. The three subsistent persons of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are certainly co-eternal and co-equal with one another. And the deity of these three persons is one nature, one substance, one divinity, one majesty, in which, in which persons there is discretion, not confusion, and distinction, not separation. I say distinction because the person of the Father is one and the Son another and that of the Holy Spirit another. For the Father is from no one, and the Son, the Son is from the Father, and the Holy Spirit is from both. Of the one and the same substance of which the Father and the Son are. And this Holy Trinity is the one and true God, which neither begins at a beginning, or is ended at an end, nor is comprehended by a place, nor varies with time. For the Father alone is not from another, and is therefore alone called unbegotten. But the Son is the everlasting Son from the Father and is therefore said to be begotten. But the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of the Father and the Son without any interval. Where thought must not be had of any times and things which have a former and a latter. And therefore he is said to be neither begotten nor unbegotten, but proceeding and neither two fathers nor two sons are believed. That he is the Spirit of the Son, the Apostle and the Evangelist testified. If anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And the apostle Paul testifies that he is the spirit of the father and the son. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If yet the, if yet the spirit of God dwells in you. And again, that he is the spirit of the father, he most clearly distinguished, saying, but of the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. 
He will also make alive your dead bodies, but that he is the spirit of the son, the same Paul testifies. But because you are the sons of God, God sent the spirit of the son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, Abba, Father. That he proceeds from the Father, the truth himself says, the spirit who proceeds from the Father, he will glorify me. That he proceeds from the Son, the same truth testifies, he will glorify me because he will receive of mine. For God forbid that the Holy Spirit should be believed to proceed as if in certain degrees from the Father to the Son and from the Son to sanctify the creature. But just as he proceeded from the Father, thus also did he proceed from the Son at the same time. For who will deny that the Holy Spirit is life? And to whom the Father is life, the Son should be life. Just as the Father has life in himself, so also did he give to the Son to have life in himself. May these few things be sufficient to have spoken about many things to you, which you are obliged to confess with the tongue and believe with the heart without ambiguity, but not examined beyond your powers. For the vision of the eyes is impaired by the ray of the material sun. Much more is the earthly mind impaired by the brightness of the ineffable deity. The Holy Catholic and Apostolic Roman Church holds this faith from the Lord to the apostles and founded on the apostles, which we admonish, entreat, and testify that you should firmly hold. These are the words of Pope Stephen V. These are the words of Pope Stephen V. Keep in mind that nothing supports what Father Peter Hears has said thus far. The interpretation of 879 by the papacy has never, was never a condemnation of the filioque outside of the creed. Rome never condemned the filioque in 879, and scholarship does not support this. As we said earlier, Rome had long held the filioque was defeated, and this just simply just doesn't work. Remember, in the years following 879, Stephen V clearly affirmed, clearly affirmed that should Rome desire, Rome could have the filioque if she so desired. And what was this based upon? Based upon the prerogatives given to St. Peter by our Lord in the Holy Scripture, in Holy Writ, very clearly laid out, very clearly quoted throughout history. Incredible, isn't it? So just to give you one example, but if you go on, then you follow the rest of the history, you read Father Seraphim Rose's Orthodox Survival Course, you'll see century after century. Yeah, don't read. Don't go to the first-hand source material. Go to an Orthodox apologetic work. Don't go to first-hand source material. Right, yeah, sure, Father Peter. We know that you've got to do first-hand source material research, not go into an apologetic work in order to get your information. Look at both sides. Look at what both sides have to say. But look at the first-hand source material, because when you do that, I am sorry, my friend, Eastern Orthodoxy fails on multiple levels. It has evolved much. Today, modern-day Eastern Orthodoxy looks little Little in particular areas, little like the faith of the early fathers. After century, Catholicism in the West departs from anything like Orthodox Christianity. There's no comparison today. It's night and day. It's, it's apples and oranges. It's a chasm between the two. We're going to look at that right now. Corin and the fathers at that council considered it to be a, di a, a diversion which cannot be uh, you know, economized, we would say, in the Orthodox Church. That was in 1755. We have a 1772 council that can, again, condemns purgatory as a non-Orthodox teaching. And then you have 18... Let's pause there for a moment. We're going to look at what Mark of Ephesus has to say about purgatory. Uh, because we're told that purgatory was condemned. So Father Peter clearly doesn't believe that purgatory is biblical or ancient was condemned by multiple Orthodox councils, we're told. But how about we look at homily one and purgatory from Mark of Ephesus? He tells you, to this we answer the following. Of the fact that those reposed in faith are without doubt helped by the liturgies and prayers and almsgiving performed for them, and that this custom has been enforced from antiquity, there is a testimony of many and various utterances of the teachers, both Latin and Greek 
spoken and written at various times in various places. But the souls are delivered thanks to a certain purgatorial suffering and temporal fire, which possess such purgatorial power and as a character of a help. This we do not find either in the scriptures or in the prayers and hymns for the dead or in the words of the teachers. Now, let's be very clear. Number one, he says that purgatorial suffering and temporal fire are not in the Bible or in the fathers. They clearly are in the Bible and fathers, very clearly. But the idea, uh, purgatory, the, uh, again, when I say fire is there, the metaphorical fire used by Paul, St. Paul is there in 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, we're not arguing for a literal fire. The church had never defined whether the fire is a literal one or not. But there are Greek fathers, fathers of the East, that spoke of the fire as a literal fire. So Father Peter hears, take that into consideration. There are prominent Eastern fathers that spoke of the fire in a literal way. But we're told that the purgatorial suffering and temporal fire are not there. They're, well, even though the, the fire didn't become bound up with a dogma, you can find multiple fathers that spoke of purgatory in that way. But let us look at what Mark of Ephesus clearly had a bone to pick with the idea that a temporal fire was real. But you'll talk about purgatorial suffering but you'll find that a lot of what Mark of Ephesus has to say is very compatible with the Catholic teaching. Because he goes onward. Well, we're not going to read the whole thing, but very interesting. Look at what he says. If souls have departed this life in faith and love, while nevertheless carrying away with themselves certain faults, whether small ones over which they have not repented at all, or great ones for which, even though they have repented over them, they did not undertake to show fruits of repentance, such souls, we believe, must be cleansed from this kind of sins. There's purgatory right there. There's a purification, the necessity of cleansing. But then he says, but not by some means of a purgat of some purgatorial fire. Well, we know that at the time, there were some Latins that were arguing for a purgatorial fire. That never became bound up with a dogma, though. So he does believe that you will undergo a kind of suffering in the afterlife. You'll be cleansed in that suffering of your sins, he says, or a definite place punishment in some place. For this, as we have aid, has not been handed down to us, but some must be cleansed in the very departure from the body, thanks only to fear. St. Gregory the Dialogist literally shows, while others must be cleansed after the departure from the body, either while remaining in the same earthly place before they come to worship God and are honored with a lot of the blessed, or if their sins were more serious and bind them for a longer duration, they're kept in Hades, but not in order to remain forever in fire and torment, but as it were in prison and confinement under guard. Very biblical. Multiple fathers interpreted uh, a kind of purgatorial prison, a kind of confinement that was temporal. All such ones, we affirm, are helped by the prayers and liturgies performed for them with the cooperation of the divine goodness and love for mankind. Thus far, we have no problem with what Mark of Ephesus has to say. He goes onward, and therefore, we see no necessity, whatever for any other punishment or for a cleansing fire, which never became bound up with a dogma. For some are cleansed by fear. By the way, I do believe that there's a cleansing fire. It, there could be. I believe purgatorial suffering can vary from person to person, and I believe that cleansing fire is the love of Christ. Cl Some are cleansed by fear. So there's a post-mortem purgatorial suffering here. There is a post-mortem suffering where one is cleansed. Look at what he says. So get it out of your mind that the early Orthodox denied post-mortem suffering. He tells you, some are cleansed by fear, while others are devoured by the nine of conscience, with more torment than any fire. Look at that. Even more torment than any fire. Still others are cleansed only the very terror before the divine glory and the uncertainty as to what the future will be. And that this is much more tormenting and more punishing than anything else. Experience it so shows. And St. John Chrysostomos testifies to us in almost all or at least most of his moral homilies, which affirm this, as likewise does the divine ascetic Dorotheus in his homily on the conscience. 
Indeed, there should be no problem with the idea of purgatory as the Pan-Orthodox Council of Jerusalem in 1672 tells us. The Pan-Orthodox Council of Jerusalem tells you, and the souls of those involved in mortal sins who have not departed in despair, but while still living in the body, pay attention, though without bringing forth any fruits of repentance, have repented by pouring forth tears, by kneeling while watching in prayers, by afflicting themselves, by relieving the poor, and finally by showing forth by their works, their love towards God and their neighbor, and which the Catholic Church has from the beginning rightly called satisfaction. Today, so many Orthodox deny that there's any kind of punishment in the afterlife, that there's any kind of punishment in the afterlife, post-mortem. <clears throat> Their souls depart into Hades, and there endure the punishment due to the sins they have committed. So they're punished in the afterlife. But they are aware of their future release from there, and are delivered by the supreme goodness through the prayers of the priests and the good works which relatives of each do for their departed especially the unbloody sacrifice benefiting the most, which each offers particularly for his relatives that have fallen asleep and which the Catholic and apostolic church offers daily for all alike. Of course, it is understood that we do not know the time of their release. We know and believe that there is deliverance for such from their direful condition and that before the common resurrection and judgment, but when we know none, this is so clearly similar to purgatory so similar to purgatory. We have post-mortem suffering. We have the Holy Eucharist being able to guide and aid, being able to aid those that are undergoing this suffering. This Look at this. They depart into Hades and they endure the punishment due to the sins they have committed. Now, this is a pan-Orthodox council of Jerusalem. Notice how everything that is said here is very compatible with the way Catholics view purgatory. What Mark of Ephesus said is very compatible. What is said here is compatible. So if there's any denial of purgatory today, if there's any denial of the way Catholics view purgatory today, well, we clearly point to the fact that the early giants of Orthodoxy held to the belief in post-mortem suffering, in post-mortem purification of sins and the afterlife. And very clearly, what Catholics believe about purgatory is not only biblical, but it is ancient as well. Now, we also realize that Father Peter, uh, by the way, one thing that I'd call Father Peter to would be a dialogue or a debate on the canon. Clearly, the canon of Scripture, clearly the books utilized as sacred Scripture, is a mass today in modern-day Eastern Orthodoxy, with scholar after scholar heaping doubt upon what the canon even is, or doubting which books are canonical or lowering the status of deuterocanonical books. What a mess that modern-day orthodoxy are in. They shouldn't be in that mess. Today, a denial of purgatory is a moving away from the ancient apostolic faith. The different canons also are moving away. And the way they view the papacy today is clearly an absolute mess. But we're not done there because even Father Peter here has spoken about the Immaculate Conception. Now, Here's a major problem for the Eastern Orthodox when we talk about the Immaculate Conception. Now, we're going to be debating the Immaculate Conception. No, not with Father Peter, although we would do it if you wanted to. We'll be debating it multiple times before the year is over in English and in Spanish. And we very much are looking forward to that. But Father Peter before has made very interesting comments denying the Immaculate Conception. That's about we have nothing of ourselves we're just basically i always say you know to my people listening to me i say i'm a i'm you know i'm happy to be uh barlam's ass basically that's how i feel you know i don't know anything i don't of course i could get it wrong but that's at least now we're, we're about to hear shockingly various passages of the bible uh from father peter here is that apparently in his opinion they deny the Immaculate Conception of Mary. Perhaps you won't be too shocked that what he's going to rattle off is the very common, are a few of the very common passages that you hear Protestants rattle off. Usually rattle off to say, well, there's only one mediator between God and man, the God-man Christ Jesus. Therefore, 
You can't pray to the saints. You can't ask for intercession. But he's going to use it to attack the dogma of the Immaculate Conception very oddly, without even realizing what the texts themselves have to say. Pay attention. Right here, this is the first uh, of, of about 10 uh, snippets from St. John's article. We can just comment on it. First, he says, he begins with scriptures. And he says, as, as you've done, what we have in scripture is that there is one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, who is the only sinless one. And you can see the scriptural passages there. Probably pretty, pretty straightforward. But he says, we don't actually have that about anyone else about everyone else including the mother of god what we have is that who is pure of defilement it says in job no one who has lived a single day of this life on earth can say that they don't they do not have some uh share in the fallen condition so father peter here is will quote from an old testament passage well before the virgin mary holy mother mary even uh existed as if when job said that 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 would negate any possibility that Holy Mary could be created without any sin. Forget that for a moment. What should shock you more than anything is that Father Peter will quote from 1 Timothy chapter 2 as if that disproves that Holy Mary was created without sin. He quotes from 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, what are we reading here in 1 Timothy? We're reading that there is only one mesites. There is only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Now, why is that? Because Christ is fully man and fully God. He's the only one that could have died on the cross for our sins. Nowhere at all. Nowhere in any papal decree, not in any early father, not in any Catholic saint or Catholic dogmatic manual, do you hear somebody say that Holy Mary is a mediator? Even the, even the theological opinion of Mary as co-redemptrix, none of those, none of those come near claiming that Mary could have died on the cross for our sins. Or that she's another mediator. How can one quote 1 Timothy 2 when we're reading about the fact that because Christ was fully God and fully man, the God man, only him and him alone could have died on the cross. Only he could have died on the cross for our sins. That is what 1 Timothy 2 is talking about. That is what it's talking about. Not negating any idea that Holy Mary was created without sin. Nowhere does it tell you that here. Nowhere can you extrapolate that here. But Father Peter believes that he has a knockout quote here. How about we look and see what great Eastern Titans had to say about how Mary was created. When you look at Mark of Ephesus, Mark of Ephesus tells you, Nevertheless, let one remove every rational account with respect to that which concerns the Theotokos, who alone is the most supernatural marvel among supernaturals realized from eternity, who is also higher than all rational discourse. For in a true way, God wished his own omnipotence to be manifested in this woman. Now, earlier in that video, Father Peter alludes to uh, Luke chapter 1 where the angel appears to Marius and he says, so this is where we're at now, that Mary has this grace, this fullness of grace. Well, if you clearly read the Greek, and as you look at Greek scholarship, Mary was full of grace before the angel even appears to her. She had that fullness of grace even before the angel appears to her. So now we don't arrive at that. At Luke 1, when the angel appears to Mary and says, we don't arrive at it right there. Rather, it was even before the angel appeared to Holy Mary that she was in full possession of that particular kind of grace, that all holy, all stainless, all sinless kind of grace. And the great Eastern fathers and the great Eastern figures for orthodoxy recognize this. 
Now, we hopped later in the history by looking at the Mark of Ephesus. How about we look at Gregory of Palamas? What does St. Gregory of Palamas have to say about Holy Mary? For although the virgin from whom Christ was born, according to his flesh, came from Adam's flesh and seed, yet this, the conception birth of Christ, was caused by the Holy Spirit, which also was cleansing her ancestors. Speaking of her ancestors. In many various ways from the start, in the sense that the various persons who lived in the sequence of the generations up to Mary were being selected for their excellence. For this reason, Noah too, a just man and perfect in his generation, as the scriptures say of him, was found worthy of this election. We can look at many more quotes from St. Gregory of Palamas, more of Mark of Ephesus, but I think you get the point. Father Peter says, you, you should know what to choose. And if you don't know to choose between orthodoxy and Catholicism, well, you haven't read enough. And then he will proceed to present it a hatchet job of arguments before you. I can tell you one thing. Modern-day orthodoxy does not resemble the faith of their fathers. And that is why it is so easy for a Calvinist or a Protestant to look into Eastern orthodoxy before Catholicism. I tell you one thing. They'll be knocking on the door of Eastern orthodoxy before they come knocking on the door of Catholicism. It is way easier to accept. Oh, well, you know, I have always had problems with Mary being all that important, you know, Mary being all sinless. Well, you know what? I've never really truly have felt comfortable with the doctrine of purgatory. Oh, well, you know what? I, I you know, the Deuterocanonical books, the way that I rejected them as a Protestant, I want to still be able to reject them. Uh, well, you know, the papacy, I've never been able to accept that. You know, I can't get on board with what Catholics say about the successor of Peter, or even Peter from the Bible, I can't get on board with that. You're going to fit right at home in Eastern Orthodoxy. But the papal claims are there in history. They're in the Bible, and they're there in early church history. The teaching in the Filioque is there as well. The Immaculate Conception is there as well. Purgatory, the canon, and I can go on and on. I love my Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters. But let us not play games. The choice is a clear one. And the choice is Catholicism. God bless you. God keep you. If you've been edified, let me know down below. If you don't agree, let me know down below. If you say, hey, I know a top-notch scholar willing to debate, I'm here. God bless you. God keep you. And for my Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters, who, by the way, I've got plenty of them that are mods, I've got close friends that are Eastern Orthodox. You know that I love you deeply. And you know that you always have a place here on my channel. And I want to tell you right now, I do not think that what Father Peter here says about Catholicism is representative of all Eastern Orthodox. I don't believe that at all. I do not. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit.